Welcome to Running the Table, the podcast where we run through everything on the table in the world of sports. We are so back. It's the return of Boom Buster Believable in 2024. If you're unfamiliar with the concept, I'm going to be running through breakdowns of each of the Big Ten basketball teams and their season thus far to determine if they've exceeded expectations, fallen short, or on right on track with what we expected. I'm going to be going through these teams in the order voted by the Big Ten media uh, before the season. So that leads us straight through West Lafayette, Indiana, where we'll start off with my Purdue Boilermakers. Purdue's currently sitting at 19-2 and two, um, and 8-2 and two in the Big Ten. That's good for second in the country at the moment. Um, they were picked as preseason number one in the Big Ten, understandably with the season that they had last year, even with the disappointing end um, and everybody that they had returning. Um, they currently sit at second in the Big Ten. Um, so r- right now, you know, they're they're working their way back towards the top, but they've got some work to do. Um, going into their key players, you can't talk about Purdue without going into the reigning, defending, and very likely second time back-to-back national player of the year, Zach Eady, who's currently sitting at 23 points, 11.4 rebounds, 2.3 blocks per game, uh, shooting 63% from the floor um, and 73.8% from the free throw line. It's obviously a, a very uh, great percentage uh, for a guy of his size. Most big men and most centers do not shoot the ball that well. And that's a big part of the reason why he's able to, you know, average as many points as he, as he gets, he gets to the line a lot and he's able to sink them. Um, right behind him. We've got essentially the, the three headed backcourt um, that have been so crucial to produce success this year, starting off with Braden Smith. Um, In his sophomore campaign, he's currently averaging 12.1 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 7 assists per game, um, as well as notching 1.5 steals per game, uh, shooting 78.6% from the free throw line and 43.8% from three. Um, So he's been crucial uh, to their success, especially out of the backcourt. He leads the offense pretty much every possession. Um, You know, he averages all those assists because not only is he just a great passer, um, but he has he has a knack of, of finding guys when they're open and, you know, creating mismatches for himself and other guys and just finding ways to get other guys open. Um, after him, you've got fifth year senior uh, Lance Jones, the transfer in from Southern Illinois University, um, also averaging 12.1 points, uh, 2.9 rebounds and 2.6 assists per game, um, also notching 1.5 steals per game as well, shooting 34.1% from three. So he's a little bit lower um, than some of their top guys, but he definitely shoots the most in terms of just pure volume from three. Uh, so his, his percentage may not be quite as up there, but he will he will chuck it with the rest of them. And and he has had some fantastic games that have been absolutely crucial for Purdue down the stretch. Um, And behind him is the, the the other half of the sophomore backcourt tandem was Fletcher lawyer um, currently averaging 11 points, 2.1 rebounds per game, shooting 85.5% from the free throw line um, and 42.4% from three. Um, So they've got a lot of guys, especially in that backcourt that have been huge in terms of compliments with Zach Eady um, and a big reason why Purdue's having such a great success this year and been able to build and even get better um, from the great season that we saw them have last year. Um, and that brings us into the Ken Palm rankings for those who um, haven't necessarily seen Boom Buster Believable before or haven't seen us here at Running the Table cover college basketball. The Ken Palm rankings are run by a guy named Ken Pomeroy, um, who does a great job of essentially compiling um, a lot of statistics on various aspects of uh, the college basketball landscape. Um, So starting off, currently Purdue is sitting at second in the country in adjusted offensive efficiency. They have one of the best offenses in the country, and they've proven that game in and game out, Um, even in some of their you know, less successful games. They've, they've had a great job of, uh, done a great job of scoring the ball efficiently and finding ways to score, whether it be, you know, a Zach Eady masterclass, or, you know, if teams are doing a good job of, of doubling down and making life hard on Zach, finding other guys on the outside, knocking down shots, finding ways to score outside of the paint. Um, but they've also had a very good defensive year as well. Um, they're currently sitting at 13th in adjusted defensive efficiency. Um, so their balance has, has been, a very key part in in their success this year. It's they've been known to have a very good offense, but if you get in shootouts with teams game in and game out, as soon as some of those shots don't start falling in either a stretch or any given game, you're very prone to losing a game. So so their defense has been able to, you know, cut them some slack and, and make up for some of the stretches where they haven't necessarily made quite as many shots. Um, and those two combined actually um Average out uh, within everything for an adjusted efficiency margin of second in the country, currently sitting only behind 
sorry, the Houston Cougars. Um, and Houston is another team that uh, has had a great season thus far. Um, but they they currently are a little bit lower in terms of the AP poll because they've lost a couple of games more recently um, in their introduction to Big 12 play for the first time this year. Um, excuse me, sinuses are really killing me this time of year. But uh, so we're looking at now at the adjusted tempo um, where they, Purdue currently sits at 180th. So Purdue has never been known to be a particularly fast team. Um, they have, they certainly have been able to push the ball more this year. And a big part of that has been um, the addition of Lance Jones. He is a guy that if he gets the ball in transition, he will push the ball up the floor and he is very willing to take on multiple guys in transition. So it's allowed them to have a different aspect to their game where it's not just let's get the rebound. Let's get it to, to Braden Smith. Let's walk it up the floor and get into our sets. Purdue's very well still known to do that, and they will still do that game in and game out. But they've been able to play a little bit faster um, and you know kind of run with some of those teams that want to play faster styles of games. Hence, for instance, their game against Arizona um, earlier on this year, which we'll get that uh, get into that here um, very soon. Um, and overall, Purdue has played a very difficult schedule actually listed as the first most difficult schedule in all of uh, college basketball at the moment. And that is adjusted. So we originally um, earlier on in the season, Purdue was sitting at second, actually behind Florida A&M. Um, that is a mid-major team, but in terms of adjusted uh, strength of schedule, they were sitting at first for a while there because they had a very hard schedule for a mid-major. But Purdue has been tested time and time again, not only in Big Ten play, um, but outside of Big Ten play. Uh, and that has, has, has shown and they've, They've handled almost all significant tests there, only of dropping two games thus far. So that moves us into checking out some of Purdue's key wins and losses thus far this year. Um, this starts all the way back um, in November in some of the early early non-conference play. Uh, we start looking at um, Purdue's journey to Maui in the Maui Invitational for the holiday tournament, where they started off with a win against, at the time, number 11 Gonzaga, 73-63 to on November 20th. Um, now, looking down the line, Gonzaga hasn't turned out to be you know quite the team they may have seen at the time, but Gonzaga still played them very difficult. Um, they still have a very solid team, but Purdue was able to come out on top in that one. Um, and then the very next game, um, you know, with these holiday tournaments, they just play them back to back to back if you keep winning. Um, so they took on number seven, Tennessee at the time, um, and they ended up winning that one 71 to 67. Um, and again, very next day, they took on at the time, number four, Marquette. Um, and won 78 to 75 um, in the Maui Invitational Championship. Um, so a very impressive three game stretch there. Not all of those teams have necessarily been able to, to stay up at the top of the rankings um, throughout the season, but that is not to take away with how good of basketball they were playing at the time. Um, and in general, the talent that they have on, on those teams, those are very three very impressive teams. And we didn't even mention the fact that Kansas was also in that uh, Maui Invitational, but Marquette happened to beat them in the semifinals. Um, so Purdue matched up with Marquette in the championship there. Um, but a great stretch, uh, a great non-conference uh test for Purdue of go playing in those three back-to-back -back games. That's some of the best uh sort of March Madness-esque uh, tests that they're going to be able to get in terms of playing high quality teams in short turnaround where you don't really get a lot of time to repair. You don't get a lot of time to rest. Um, so Purdue definitely needed that and they continued their uh, non-conference dominance um, and able to come out with a holiday tournament a tournament championship there. Um, so that success didn't necessarily last um, very long heading into December where they ended up getting their first loss, actually in their first game of conference play at Northwestern, 92 to 88 in overtime uh, on December 1st. It was a tough game. They, they really battled, but despite them putting up uh, 88 points in overtime, it really didn't feel like Purdue was, was playing their best game. Um, Boo Booey and Northwestern, you know, had a fantastic game. Boo Booey is, um, truly one of a kind when it comes to uh, Big Ten guards and and really, I, I think, an underrated guard um, really in the country. Uh, so Northwestern played a, played a great game. Purdue, you know, held on towards the end, but Northwestern edged them out in overtime to give Purdue their first loss of the season. Um, they did bounce back uh, a couple weeks later in the middle of September, uh, sorry, in the middle of December, um, where Purdue gets the win over number one at the time, Arizona, 92 to 84 in the Indy Classic on December 16th. Um, so that was another similar to the Maui Invitational. You got neutral court, um, although I will say playing an Indy, a lot of people viewed that as a Purdue home game, understandably so. Purdue fans travel well in general, but when you just have to go down to Indianapolis, 
you got a lot of people uh, that are going to come that are the Purdue faithful there. So, so that was about as close as you can get to a uh, neutral site home court advantage uh, for the Boilermakers there. But they still did a great job. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Arizona was a very fast tempo um, speed you up team, but Purdue was able to take it in stride and, and, and really actually play with some speed right up against them. Um, and they come out on top 92 to 84. So a very impressive showing by, by Purdue. I think that was probably their most complete game thus far. Um, then we start getting into January where Purdue ends up with their second conference loss and actually their second loss overall, um, at Nebraska. And I think we talk about Arizona being their best showing. I think this was by far their worst showing. Um, they end up losing 88 to 72. So a 16 point loss at Nebraska. Now, granted, I mean, we got to give Nebraska a lot of credit. They played a great game. They had a great strategy. Um, and the Cornhuskers are, they're a good team this year. And they're also very difficult to beat at home. To me, they're, they're another team that's a very different team at home versus away because um, we've seen them have some significant issues on the road, which, to be fair, a lot of teams do in the Big Ten. So it's not all that surprising, but they are electric uh, in Lincoln. Um, and they came out firing, and they I think they shot like 60% from three or something to win that game. Um, so they definitely deserve to win that one. Um, definitely a tough loss for Purdue, but they definitely ended up learning from that one. Um, and the last key win we'll talk about is – any anytime you get a, a win in a rivalry game is is very important, but especially when it is at uh, Assembly Hall, where Purdue ended up winning at uh, Indiana, eighty seven to sixty six on January sixteenth, um, and that was a massive win for them. So putting all of that resume together, that leaves Purdue with seven quad one wins, um, which leads the country. And, you know, it's understandable with the success that they've had um, and having the number one strength of schedule um, that does, you know, lead the country in, in quad one wins, as well as they've racked up five quad two wins. Um, so seven and two in quad one and five and oh in quad two, that puts them at 12 combined quad one and two wins, which, of course, also leads the country. So it's shown, you know, just how well Purdue has played thus far this year. Um, so in general, the Boilermakers are back in a big way um, after their collapse in the first round of the NCAA tournament last year, um, making statement non-conference wins uh, throughout November on their way to the Maui Invitational Championship in what we can say is arguably the most stacked lineup of teams we've seen possibly ever in that tournament, um, as well as a undefeated non-conference slate for the third year in a row, uh, making them only the third team in the last 50 years to do so, joining the 2010 to 2012 Syracuse and 1992 to 94 Duke teams. Now, can that finally translate to non-conference or can they translate that non-conference dominance and neutral court dominance to the NCAA tournament? Because we've seen a lot of that dominance in the regular season, but obviously, you know, people want to talk about, and rightfully so, um, that hasn't quite translated to the NCAA tournament in, in past years, um, or at least in terms of the teams that they have ended up losing to with St. Peter's more recently, and of course, FDU last year. Um, that's the biggest question for the Boilermakers this year. Can they translate that success past the regular season? They've been one of the best regular season teams um, in recent memory, not only this year, and last year, and even some of the year before. Um, but they need to finally be able to quiet the demons um, and turn that into some March success. Um, but they've looked very solid throughout the first half of the season as we head into February. Um, now, apart from their two losses, they've beat some of the best teams in the country on neutral floor, as well as defended Mackey, um, as they're known for doing. But the trouble for them has, has come from playing on the road in the Big Ten. And to a certain extent, you know, that's to be expected. They're four and two on the road in Big Ten play um, with their four wins coming at a dominant showing at Maryland, uh, their record setting performance at Assembly Hall um, in IU, which that 21 point win uh, was the uh, biggest point margin in Assembly Hall history in terms of that rivalry matchup um, and the biggest uh, point margin uh, in a victory since I believe it was back in the 1930s. So I believe it was about a 90 year stretch there. Um, so, so truly a, a record setting performance. Um, and earlier on in January, they, in January, they got their home win or their away win at Iowa. Um, and most recently uh, just winning at Rutgers, finally shaking the rack demons um, and getting their first win at the rack since 2018, uh, where they snuck away with a two point win as the number three team in the country at the time. So this senior class um, just now gets their first win at Rutgers. So they finally were able to, uh, to you know, shake those demons and, and finally get over that hump, which I think is a, a big step for them in terms of winning a difficult game on the road where 
in a lot of those similar types of games in the past, they haven't necessarily found a way to come out with a win. Wasn't necessarily a pretty one, but they got the job done. Um, so their two conference road losses being their only two losses this season. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we're at Northwestern to start December and at Nebraska towards the beginning of January. Um, so only having two losses at the stage of the season obviously puts them up amongst the top five teams, top three teams in the country still um, with a convincing argument with their resume uh, to be considered the top team in the country. But that all being said, the blueprint still kind of remains similar for taking down the Boilermakers. Um, and what some of that looks like is high ball pressure on Purdue's guards, which makes their entry passes to Zach Eady difficult, as well as it speeds them up. They haven't necessarily dealt with, you know, high ball pressure a lot, especially if whatever refs that they're playing with aren't necessarily calling a lot of those hand check bump fouls. It really kind of rattles them and it pushes them out of their, their sets, which is what Purdue's bread and butter is. They will run those sets down your throat if you let them. Um, and another thing for them is, is cause turnovers. They had 17 turnovers against Northwestern and 14 against Nebraska um, and free possessions and the ability to get points off turnovers against an offense as potent as Purdue is crucial. Anytime you can limit them to not getting a shot as well as not play against Purdue's set defense, which has proven again to be a top 15 defense in the country this year um, is a really a great way to, you know, keep yourself in the game and against great teams, against good teams, the best you can do a lot of the time is keep yourself in the game. And then down the stretch, anything can happen when it gets to crunch time. Um, and another thing that has proven to be, you know, kind of crucial and really important against a team like Purdue is, is hitting your threes. Um, all of these games have, have runs in both directions. Purdue will get hot and go on a seven, 10, 12 point run, and then they'll go cold for a while. And the momentum will, will flip the other way um, and giving the opponent a run of their own. Um, and three point defense has been something that Purdue has struggled with at points throughout the season. Um, so to, to outscore an offense like Purdue, um, even on an off night, for the Boilermakers, um, you'll need the three ball to fall. You saw that in both games um, at Northwestern and at Nebraska. Nebraska definitely being um, the big highlight there because they just seemed like they could not miss, especially uh, Kese Tominaga and CJ Wilshire. Um, those guys made Purdue lives absolutely hell in that one. Um, but that's just been that's just been crucial. And in general, your team's always going to do better, you know, when you're when you're hitting the three ball. But that has been the key to beating Purdue. If you haven't sh shot the ball well from three. It's really hard to beat Purdue because with a guy like Zach Eady in the center, it's really hard to outscore them from two. Um, but in general, not even diehard Purdue fans expected them to go undefeated. So they're in a very believable position right now um, at this stage of the season, having their two losses. You know, the one of them being a little bit more concerning at Nebraska was obviously a bit of a surprise, but um, really the question for them is, can they learn from their shortcomings and figure out ways to work around the style of play and the style of defense um, that teams now are aware of and know that has worked for quite a, a few teams, the FDUs, the St. Peter's, and even North, the North Texases of the world when it comes to the tournament time. Um, and it's one thing to know what you want to do. It's another thing to be able to implement it. Um, and some of those teams they found ways to implement it. Um, because again, if it was that easy to implement it, Purdue wouldn't look as good as they they do right now. They wouldn't win as many games by, you know, these 15, 20, even 30 point margins um, as they have. So, I mean, for Purdue, the ceiling is still absolutely Phoenix in the final four, which would be Purdue's first since 1980. You know, that's a big, you know, gripe against them and gripe against Painter, Gene Cady, the program as a whole is they've, they've yet to eclipse that final four mark in a long time. Back in 1980, that was where Joe Barry Carroll led the Boilermakers um, to the Final Four and fell to UCLA, um, where Carroll was then selected with the number one overall pick um, to the Golden State Warriors. So you're talking about some, some college and NBA history there, dating all the way back to 1980. Um, but for Purdue, they have all the weapons that they need. You've got the reigning unanimous National Player of the Year and front runner, front runner to win it in back-to-back -back seasons, which obviously is so rare. Um, they've got talented scoring options at, you know, at their guards. We mentioned their, their three um, guards that lead the team in scoring behind Zach Eady. Um, and they really have depth at every position. They can go eight, nine, 10 deep on any given day. Um, and depending on how Matt Painter chooses to flip his substitutions around, um, they can put a lot of different lineups out there to play a lot of different styles of basketball. And, and most of all, they have experience. Almost all of these guys were on this team last year that, that, had such success exceeded massively on their expectations. 
but then, you know, fell short where it mattered. You had two freshman freshman guards that got really thrown into the fire, um, and you saw them regress as the season went on. But they made it through that. They've learned a lot. They've grown a lot. Um, and of course, the, the the famous saying of the best thing that, that can happen to uh, to freshmen in college basketball is they become sophomores. And these guys have, and, and they've really proven it um, with the ways that they've stepped up this year. Um, so they've really been through the fire, through the countless disappointments over the last couple of years. And of course, last year being the biggest of them all. Um, but, you know, bringing in some, so, some great true freshmen, as well as Lance Jones as the fifth year senior that provides a different type of experience, obviously from a different far different team, far different organization. Um, but that has brought a very different uh, depth and experience to this Boilermaker team. Um, but even though it feels like, you know, a lot of people talk about, it's like, oh, but what's different about this this team? It seems like they're just running it back sort of the same way that they did last year. So how is it going to be any different? Well, to me, some of the big differences from last year to this year is their consistency of their scoring options outside of Zach Eady. As a team, they're shooting exactly 40% from three right now, which is amongst the top in the country, actually, much less in the Big Ten, um, shooting drastically higher than last year, where they ended up shooting 32.2% from three as a team. So you could see that's where what really ended up being their downfall in that uh, March Madness uh, first round game, where they did a good job of of making Zach Eady's life miserable, and Purdue could not knock down the three to save their life. This year, it's been different. You couldn't, you you haven't been able to just hone in on Zach Eady because you've got, you know, five plus guys. If you got at least four or five guys that shoot 40% or higher from three, um, whether it be on, you know, limited attempts or, you know, a considered amount of attempts with guys like Braden, um, Fletcher Lawyer, uh, Mason Gillis, guys like that. Um, so they've gotten better at knocking down their open shots that inevitably come with as many digs and double teams as Zach Eady gets. Um, and that's been a huge reason for their uptick in offensive efficiency this year, where we've seen the Boilers average 85 points per game as a team compared to the 72.7 um, that they fell to by the end of last season as, you know, they sort of really worn down, especially their their guards, and, and they stopped hitting a lot of their shots. Um, so for them to average, you know, 12 plus more points per game, um, obviously you want to see that continue as the season goes on, because as we get into February and March, this is around the time where last year you started to see the Boilermakers, you know, the wheels started to fall off a little bit. They started to get a little derailed, if you will. Um, but as of right now, they've proven that they can keep this offensive efficiency at a sustainable margin. Um, and at least, you know, maybe you won't see all of their guys playing, you know, their best basketball every single game, but your goal is, is like, you pretty much know what you're going to get out of Zach Eady. Can you get combination of solid to very good performances out of Braden Smith, Lance, Lance Jones, Fletcher lawyer. Can you get two out of those three guys? Or if you get all three, I don't know if there's a team that can beat them, but it is pretty rare to get all three of those guys, you know, playing their best basketball at the same time, but they don't necessarily need that when they've got the talent top to bottom that they have on their roster. Um, but they've still got their work cut out for them if they want to win the big 10 still, because them dropping those two games early in conference play, put them in a bit of a hole, but the gap has shortened a bit with Wisconsin losing their first conference matchup at Penn state recently. Um, so now they're now only one uh, game back from Wisconsin and Purdue does uh, still have both matchups against Wisconsin in Mackey uh, and up in Madison still yet to go. So there's a lot of opportunity for Purdue to catch ground and overtake them. They just, you know, got to keep uh, staying the course and, and stay solid, solid in big 10 play. But I mean, the Boilermakers goals are much bigger than that. They're going to need to work on toning down the mistakes, playing with confidence and don't get caught up by all the pressure of the past shortcomings and, you know, the 10 different narratives um, that the media is going to push come NCAA tournament time. Everybody has been talking about it. Everybody will continue to keep talking about it, especially when it comes to bracketology, selection Sunday, and whatever their inevitable first round matchup is. Um, they're going to need to be able to tone that out and just worry about, you know, doing what they do best, no matter the seed, no matter the opponent, um, focus on, you know, their style of basketball and what makes them such a good basketball team. Um, and if they do that, it's tough to say who can stop them. Um, but it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to, you know, actually go and back it up. Um, so only time will tell, but it really is, feels like it's now or never for Matt Painter and the Boilermakers. 
But that's all I've got for today. This is just the beginning. Um, there are a lot of Big Ten teams to cover, as I discovered last time. Uh, but we're going to keep diving into these teams as the season progresses and we keep our sights set on March. Here on the channel, we're wrapping up the NFL season, uh, covering the rest of the playoffs and the Super Bowl here coming up. Um, and we're looking to keep things interesting and, and switch some things up a little bit with some potential more individual content with both Drew and I covering some of our favorite teams and favorite sports as we head into the spring and summer months. So stay tuned, like, and subscribe for more, but until next time we out.